Hey, everyone. I'm Doug. This is Charles. Uh, we work at Reddit. Next. Okay. So, yeah, that's us. You can find us there. Uh, uh, I've uh, recently, we are about to come out with Trey. Uh, Max and I are coming out with this book, as many of you may know. I remember at Haystack 2018 when Trey and I were, you know, Trey was talking about finishing this in six months. Uh, but it's now, it's, it's ready, and we're talking about the new AI future that we're all part of uh, and search. And if you, there's a discount code there, please check it out. But there's also a community. If you join the community at this QR code, you can, uh, the first, uh, the, we're going to pick, do like randomly pick people from the people who join this community and give people free books. So join up. Uh, and there's a lot of people there, you know, we're trying to start people talking about search and that kind of thing. So one thing, uh, the other thing I'll mention about this, Trey will be around, Trey Granger right there. Uh, Trey will be around if you want to talk about the book or anything or have questions about AI-powered search, adding AI to search, or doing things like RAG. Feel free to come chat with us. So let me just do this. So we're going to talk today about adding learning to rank to an existing, mostly working search system. I think this is a pretty common use case. Like most people out there, you know, you sort of have, we're not throwing away our search systems for the most part and like rebuilding them from scratch. We're trying to evolve something that's there, that's working, that is, has, you know, has, to, has certain uptime constraints and everything. And it's mostly working high scale. And I'm specifically going to talk about Reddit search. So if you think about Reddit search, the first thought you might have is, OK, this is like a classic text-based information retrievable. Uh, you have this like post here, something about NumPy arrays. It was posted a certain date. Uh, and we're going to do, people might ask questions of this data, do classic text-based search. But it's a little more complicated than that. People also do uh, what I would think of as social search. So social search is interesting subdomain that doesn't get talked about much, but it's very much like I want to know, I want to know this event that's happening now. So you see a fire truck going down the street of your highway, you might go to your subreddit, or you might go to Twitter, and you might start searching like what's going on in my community, uh, and the, the search results page is constantly changing and updating. Uh, there might be a latest on Twitter versus like sort of top most informative. I think that's an interesting subdomain that probably could have its own separate conference talk. But also sometimes it's a social community and people ask for very personal things. And that's one of the things that I get excited about Reddit is it's a place people like connect at a very personal level. So in this case, someone asking about a golden retrieval travel anxiety um, and going and looking for really as opposed to, um, I think AI and ChatGPT tends to have a very like Wikipedia voice. Uh, it's like reading a Wikipedia article. It's very general. The nice thing about Reddit, it's, ex it's extremely human focused. So you get this subjective human experience of like what actually helps specific people solve their problems. And I think that's really important uh, tro treasure trove of information. Um, today's talk, we're going to talk about learning to rank. Of course, we have vector search, and that's a whole other team. And I won't, I'm not going to volunteer them to do a talk. But we're talking about lexical retrieval. So lexical retrieval, uh, you know, everyone talks about vector search these days, but lexical retrieval is still really important and needs machine learning. And really, that means like normal text matching with stemming and different attributes, but also ranking of different things like recency, for us, the number of votes that something gets when something's trending and that sort of thing. And that still is the 90% the backbone of our search. It's really important to get that right. Um, and I'm going to talk about why we care about this. There, there is a fundamental, like, even if LTR itself, I'm going to talk about as a kind of forcing function for teams to up their level of maturity and measurement of search. That's another really important aspect when someone, as, I remember as a consultant, someone will come and want to do, I feel like learning to rank is not necessarily like the, the hotness that it once was, but when people will come to us, it was really fundamentally a question about how do we measure things better and how do we improve? Because um, if I'm Mr. ML model here, Clippy ML model, what do I need if I'm going to uh, want to promote relevant results? 
If you're an ML model, first you need training data, right? You need examples of your queries, posts, and what's relevant and what's not, right? So that's, that's the first. And we have to ask ourselves if that's any good. We, of course, need features. Um, and these are the lexical features I was talking about. Did the title match the, the keywords at all, like one or zero? What was the BM25 score of something? How recent was it? Did the subreddit match the query? Did someone actually type r slash whatever? Um, and you can, your mind can just go on and imagine things, or imagine things we might put in the index, like maybe someone has a knowledge graph or whatever. And honestly, lexical search engines still are great at this sort of like gen general feature engineering and matching of um, these different attributes. Uh, still, a lot of the stuff that gets talked about in relevant search are great inputs to learning to rank. And then finally, we have to throw it to production. So I just yeet it somewhere right. Uh, and Charles will cringe because he does infrastructure. Uh, and uh, of course, this part, I just put it somewhere and it just works, right? And that's, that's easy. And that's, of course, not the case. Um, so when we answer Mr. ML model's questions, it's really a forcing function. If I get garbage training data and garbage features, I'm going to have garbage results. And why is that a forcing function? Yeah, and I get amazing things, of course, going to have amazing results. Because even without an ML model, these are the kinds of things that would feed into a mature organization doing regular relevance tuning. Training data is just evaluation data. Features are just things that I use in my ranking function that I might hand tune. And all of these things, if I can't get them right, I'm not going to have even good manual relevance. So um, one thing to think about learning to rank, it is also, in some ways, a way of supporting just non-machine learned relevance. It's a way of, of improving our maturity in all of these areas so that search can have a, uh, a methodical, data-informed way of moving forward. So um, with that in mind, I'm going to talk just about, OK, let's get into the nuts and bolts of our training data and feature selection. So like I said, this is a forcing function. Training data is a um, big part of it. But really, the foundation of training data are you know, things like judgment lists, where we can compute statistics like NDCG that you all may be familiar with, sort of measure our search. Uh, and we, part of, a huge part of this project was actually building uh, search quality tooling. And I've, see, I've heard and seen lots of people who just jump straight to the LTR part, and they don't necessarily try it out as search quality for manual relevance first. Um, Searchbench that I mentioned, the, the Golden Retriever mentions, is our, our tool that we do offline evaluation. And this was a graphic I actually shared with the team to really encourage them to be using it, because the LTR project really depended on everyone who is working on relevance to be using this tool and seeing if our offline experiments actually that we were doing in SearchBench had anything to do with the, um, their online when they shipped them to online. Because if they didn't, we shouldn't be training um, any LTR models on that data. But if they did, and we iterated on that underlying uh, evaluation data, then we might be able to get to the pinnacle of this pyramid. Um, so we started with two years ago or so, we did human evaluation. This is our like basic, uh, you know, did some basic like com you know comparing for this query just to get some human evaluators crowdsourced. But we did this in support of creating an engagement just to learn like what what seems to correlate with human labels, and for us um, this click plus dwell time, uh, where someone clicks and they stay on a search result both correlates with the human labelers, and it also correlates with some of our uh, more coarse-grained metrics that are harder to move, like uh, DAO, daily average users, and stuff that social media sites care about. So this, for us, is, is sort of becomes the gold, gold standard. Uh, then we actually have to use the judgments. In this case, uh, we are running our actually ship trying out offline Experiments, like I said, did it go up, ship it to an A-B test, and hopefully those, those judgments and sort of like things we improved offline also improve things online with our conversion metrics. And if they don't, we go back and we debug those judgments. Finally, if we are confident with this, we can train them and, and yeet them to production. 
So uh, training, just what does training actually look like? And this was one of the first problems that we notice and is a pretty common problem with learning to rank projects. If you just focus on things that are engaging, so for us, we're focusing on engagement labels. What is engaging? Did something get a click plus dwell or it didn't? Of course, to get a click plus dwell, it has to show up in the search results, right, to begin with. So almost everything in our training data would have this feature, title, did the title match or not, set to one. So you have these like, extremely strong biases towards certain features. Um, and you notice there's no way a model could see the pattern here that this feature uh, actually matters. It just sees it as one. There's no example saying a zero in this is actually irrelevant. So one trick, and this is a hack that I've seen used and used at multiple places, is to literally just sample other queries as negative examples for this query. So in this case, we have this golden retrieval travel anxiety. We sample that, and we say, oh, this is actually a negative result for this other query. And there is a very small chance you will have a, a false positive, but almost all the time, a positive match for one randomly selected query is not a positive match for another. And then we can start to see patterns like title match of zero actually correlates with no relevance. So that's important. Getting, some, getting more negative labels is actually really important for learning to rank, to learn these basic patterns that we sort of take for granted. And now we can see the patterns. And um, the next question becomes, how do we choose features? So features being our lexical ranking. Um, so features in LTR, a very common problem is that they are heavily correlated. So obviously, if something matches the title, it's probably going to match the body. These things tend to be correlated. So that's something we have to be aware of. Um, one thing we want in a good feature is something that actually adds information. So the number of votes may actually have nothing to do with the title matching the query. So that adds information to our model. That's a very important uh, attribute we look for in a feature. The very first thing. So one thing we do is we will study the correlation of features to other features. So you can see here, the bottom left, you see the comments and the votes for us. Uh, they don't, the, the brightness means they correlate. Obviously, they sort of correlate with each other, like more comments, more votes. But they have nothing to do with the, uh, some of these other features that have to do with matching. So that's a great indication that that's a good feature. And, that, and the recency, how, hour, how many hours ago something is, has nothing to do really with any feature. So when we're looking at these, uh, these features, we're always looking for things that are adding new information. So the first thing I would do if a team came to me with a feature they wanted to try out and search, I would say, does it add information? And I'm actually going to talk about more, this more in my MyCES talk, uh, which is another great search conference that happens almost all the time after Berlin Buzzwords. So yeah, so I already said we're going to find these things. And then finally, um, a very simple thing we'll do is just like, did we get independent features and did they improve the model? So if they improve the model and they're independent, that's a really good sign that we should be thinking about adding them to the model into the mix. Um, and that's sort of how we go about looking for features. Um, and sort of how do we choose these? Like, or I think this slide's actually about model architecture. So, Interesting thing to me is there are so many options for model architecture. All the things I've talked about up to now have nothing to do with the model architecture. I, like earlier, and I had that triangle, and then there was the yellow part of L doing LTR. Probably the peak of that, L that yellow part, which is probably the last decision I'm going to make, is which model I'm going to choose. And there are many options. We sort of more or less go for now, and this may change, but for now, we're just more or less going with our, our, what's our comfort. Uh, and where we feel comfortable, because most of the time, the training data supports um, what we need. I will say that what you have to look for in a model for learning to rank, think, can deal with correlated features, because that will just happen, uh, and deals with a, some kind of loss function that can handle ranking, um, and nonlinearity. These things are like dependent on each other. So that's where decision tree models, XGBoost, are really popular because they're decision trees. If this, then that is a very common pattern in search relevance. So uh, I'm going to pass this over. 
Actually, I'm going to speak a little bit and then I'm going to pass things over to you. Mm -hmm. So the next thing, we have to yeet features to prod. And yeeting features to prod, of course, or yeeting the models to prod is uh, what we're going to talk about. We use solar learning to rank. So solar rolling to rank, I want to just shout out the solar committers. I think I saw Christine here, Alessandro's here, and the CIS team. We really depend and, and on their work, and it's just phenomenal work. Um, uh, we use solar functionality for feature calculation and top end re-ranking. So uh, the reason we chose solar LTR is it basically fits in easily with our infrastructure as opposed to trying to integrate Reddit's existing ML infrastructure to do inference. Um, Reddit's existing ML infrastructure is very feeds focused, which is very much focused on recent content. Search for, L for Reddit is very much focused on the almost 20 years of content that Reddit has. Like seven years or so is the mean for SEO, like the, or I think that's not the mean, but when things stop being useful. Um, Solar LTR has some limitations, but they're things that we can overcome. And also, it's entirely within our team's control. It's like, as part, part of our infrastructure and very core and close to what we do. Um, solar LTR, and this is a great tutorial from zero to Solar LTR. You can see the query DSL that you get. Many people here may know, be familiar with this, but you can express your features. It's not really a feature store so much as it's a feature calculator that takes parameters like keywords and computes a score. Uh, Training time, I can say, here is the input to my features. Give me a feature vector with the keywords. And, you know, here's the keywords. Give me a feature vector of all these features for each of these documents relative to those keywords. So I can use that to look for patterns. And we just issue a query like that. And then we can store the model, which can then, uh, at search time, when we pass these parameters again, extract the features. And finally, re-rank uh, as a final stage of after the initial retrieval. And re-ranking is done per shard, so you get kind of a very, that's one nice thing about doing it within, natively within solar, you get a per shard re-rank. So that gives you actually deeper than the re-rank depth that you would normally get. Um, so I'm going to pass things over to, to Charles, our infrastructure engineer, who's going to talk about infrastructure. All right. Let's get everyone. this out. Uh, so I'm going to give you kind of like a, a walkthrough of what Reddit search infrastructure looks like, um, starting off with kind of like a basic uh, introduction and then kind of going deeper into some of the problems that we faced uh, with uh, bringing LTR to production. Uh, so what you see here is a very simplified view. Uh, we're kind of um, not looking at the front end, we're looking mostly at the back end perspective. And what we do is we run a search service uh, microservice, uh, which is deployed in Kubernetes, uh, so we can scale effectively, and it's bulkheaded, uh, so that way we can scale different types of searches effectively. Uh, then those queries are then sent to our solar clusters, uh, and those solar clusters are, again, scaled differently because, uh, as, you, as you may know, there are different types of searches in solar. Uh, so right now, for today, we'll be looking at our post-all um, or like our post-search uh, um, and, and how we scale that. Yeah. So. While bringing LTR to production, one of the questions that we had is uh, how are we going to, to test this and then also bring it to production? So uh, we had two options. Option one was either an isolated cluster um, or use uh, the current production cluster, uh, pair it with LTR, uh, and then test that way. So what we did is we had a conversation about the pros and cons about both approaches. And as you can see here, um, Highlighted in green are some like the are, are some of the um, like key key ideas that we discussed uh, while making this decision. Uh, so with the single cluster, which is already the the deployed production cluster, um, the nice thing is that it was already built. Uh, the other really nice thing is that the latency and the metrics that we pull from this cluster uh, are not going to be different. There's not going to be any difference between uh, that uh, the LTR and the production. And then the other thing is that if we so choose, uh, we could vertically scale it. Uh, with an isolated cluster, the nice thing is that it would be completely safer uh, just because we would separate the new LTR feature uh, from the current production, um, uh, current production traffic and we'd be able to test in isolation. 
Uh, the other nice thing is that we would be able to iterate very quickly on this because it would not initially be production facing. Uh, so we can make quick changes and then move forward quickly. So what did we choose? Take one. Uh, so the first thing that we tried is we wanted to optimize between, uh, we saw that we wanted to optimize uh, dollar cost and then also observing the, the uh, metrics and not having any delta between the metrics. Uh, so what we did is we uh, used our current production cluster and paired it with LTR and re-ranked uh, with, with live production traffic. So here we're going to get a bit deeper uh, into, into the architecture. Uh, so what we use uh, in between all of these layers is Envoy as our proxy layer. And the really nice thing about this proxy layer is that we can manipulate the traffic or the request patterns uh, based off of how we want to or so choose. Uh, so at the first layer, what we see is that we're taking that live production traffic, and then we're essentially mirroring it between shadow pods, uh, or calling it shadow traffic, uh, and then the actual production search service. Uh, so an en Envoy makes this very easy for us to do. Uh, we just need to uh, define different clusters and then route traffic to that. Uh, then, uh, as you can see on the tail end, uh, we are routing those same uh, modified queries, those modified LTR queries that Doug showed earlier, uh, to, to the LTR cluster. As you may have guessed, this killed production. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and what does that actually look like? Um, so this is actually a pretty detailed view of one of our larger, larger clusters. And I'm going to highlight a couple of things so, so uh, we're on the same page. Uh, as you can see, the black dots there, for those who are not familiar with solar, uh, means that those are the leaders for that particular shard. Uh, so when a shard has a leader and multiple replicas, it is healthy, uh, but then, uh, we get into this really, really dire case where some shards, like shard eight, have no up replicas or up pods, right? Uh, for, for our architecture, we have one replica per pod. Uh, so when I reference pod, it means that one replica is done. Um, and then you can see uh, like shard four is in a very dire state where it has no leaders and it has no replicas, right? So that means that this cluster is not able to serve traffic whatsoever and our users are very unhappy. So take two. Uh, and this is where the power of Envoy comes in, uh, paired with how we've uh, built out the bulkheaded architecture. Uh, so again, we're still proxying the request to the shadow pods. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, we're actually routing that same traffic to the new LTR cluster, which will scale separately. Now. Because we have these two different testing environments, uh, and also the nice thing is that with, uh, with that parallelized pattern, we don't care about the response from, from L the LTR cluster. Uh, we just care about the metrics. Uh, so we just drop that. Um, and live users still get the, get the, the results that they need. Um, and then here's another really nice thing. Once we validated that, we can actually split our traffic. So what you're seeing here is that Envoy layer, uh, we're actually splitting the, the live production traffic, uh, and 10% is going to the LTR cluster, and then 90% is going to the actual production cluster. Now, as many of you know, uh, Solar is a Java-based server. And as a result, there are many things that we have to think about. Uh, for example, garbage collection or the reclamation of memory, which is very different from like the C world where you manage your own memory. So a quick, quick review from uh, what Doug mentioned earlier. So the way that uh, re-ranking works is that we will retrieve the, the top end documents and then we'll re-rank per shard. And the way that works is we'll calculate the features that we need for the, uh, the model and then we'll send it to Mr. ML model. Uh, and then we'll return the re-rank results to the users. Now, normally, when we are increasing traffic, and what you're looking at here is just the total request um, metric that we get from solar, um, as we slowly increase traffic, we see um, pretty standard behavior, right? GC time slightly increase, latency slightly increase, which is expected. But then, after a while, when we increase traffic too much, uh, we enter this death spiral. We enter this, this uh, state that we saw earlier before um, where uh, over time, and you'll see kind of as to why that happens, um, we will see 
uh, kind of like the cluster going to this inconsistent state, where we have to manually intervent. Um, essentially, um, like re-bringing up the cluster, uh, shedding traffic, shedding indexing traffic. Uh, so what we did was we took a little bit of time to analyze what exactly was happening. Uh, so what you can see here, this is a graph that's detailing the amount of time that we spend garbage collecting. Um, so on the left-hand side, you see pretty standard behavior, um, where, where we're maybe roughly around 500 or so milliseconds spent uh, garbage collecting. And we use a generational garbage collector for this, G1GC, uh, verse, and we're experimenting with others as well, but uh, for this one, we really do care about those stop the world events and things like that. Um, so what you can see as traffic starts to increase, we enter the death spiral stage. Uh, and then there you can see that garbage collection is taking 30 seconds. Uh, that means the, the cluster is not doing anything other than just like trying to clean up all the objects that were created. So. Uh, we, we dug a little deeper, and at Reddit, we have a culture of experimentation. Um, so kind of finding a hypothesis and then validating it with experiments. Uh, so looking at a, a, like a, a finer grained window, uh, we looked at traffic uh, for, uh, increases from 5% to 10%. And what you can see here um, is, is a highlight of the problem. We can see that from 5 to 10%, there's a drastic jump in the amount of time that is spent garbage collecting. Why is that? Uh, you can see here, uh, just like the total number of GC events that are happening increases drastically again from uh, 5 to 10%. And as mentioned, we are using a generational garbage collector, so we're looking at um, a graph of both the young gen and old gen. Old gen is pretty stable, while young gen, which is the newly created objects, um, drastically increase. So why are newly created objects increasing? So after some thorough investigation, uh, what you're looking at here is a graph of the filter cache and the behavior of that filter cache when we increase traffic. Uh, so we're actually going to start on the left-hand side. Uh, you can see the number of objects and the number of items in Solar's filter and Solar's filter cache nearly triples, with uh, just a like five to ten percent, like five to ten percent jump in traffic. Um, that is very odd behavior, um, and the thought was maybe it's because of the features that we're using in LTR. Uh, again, you can see uh, now on the right-hand side, uh, which I think might be your left, um, you can see that the, the uh, miss rate also increases, right, which is something that we do not want, especially when comparing with the current production cluster that is currently running. And again, looking at the hit ratio, which really does matter uh, because the internet is just full of caches and caches are what kind of drive things forward um, and help us with, with uh, lowering latencies. Uh, we can see that there's a, a huge 10% dip in the hit ratio. So we looked a little bit at the features, uh, and this is kind of zoomed in view of the, the slides that Doug shared. Um, and what you're looking at is a solar feature and uh, here you're looking at a filter query, and we have about 46 or so of, uh, features, with six of them being filter queries. Um, and what Solar does um, is, is cache these. Right? So you can see here, uh, should we be caching these or should we not be caching these? Uh, uh, the, the other thing with this, um, yeah, should we, should we be caching these or should we not be caching these? Uh, and the, the thing that we did is now that we have a, a hypothesis, uh, we kind of looked at different ways that we can break down the problem uh, and ran four different experiments. Uh, the first is to re-rank with no changes. Uh, then there's no re-ranking and to understand the behavior of the, the, the filter cache. Uh, and the reason is because the way that the filter cache works, um, it calls a method that is cache aware. And because we're re ranking uh, we, we are re-ranking and we're like the filter cache is the filter query is based on the first initial query um, we don't really need those objects to live for for quite a long time um, so we set no fil no FQ and then we also uh, turn off the cache so these are the results from that experiment and what you can see is that initial view when we turn off uh, re-ranking and then 
when we turn off the, the filter queries, what we see is that there is actually a dip in uh, the amount of time spent garbage collecting. And the slight increase is normal because we are, at, we are still adding um, like more work to solar. Um, and then there on the, on the far side, we're seeing uh, what happens when we are not caching and it's similar behavior. And the interesting thing is when you zoom in a little bit, uh, those pods that have higher GC times, if you just restart them, GC times will, will again lower and um, will be in a stable state. Uh, the other nice thing is that you can see originally GC pause times were slowly increasing over time. Uh, so if you were to leave this running for like a week or so, you'd be in a very dire state versus now that it's stable. Now, how did the cache behave? You can see there's a huge dip in the number of objects that are now being cached. And you can see the similarity between uh, no filter queries and no caching. Um, so it looks like we have found, found the, the, the culprit. Uh, and you can also see that the hit ratio, or, or the number of misses, has decreased as well. And our hit ratio uh, is back to, back to normal. It's actually slightly higher. And latencies have also stabilized. And this is a very interesting graph because you can see sometimes latencies would hit one second. Um, and then there are other spikes, which we actually determine what the, the cause for those spikes are, um, like during restarts. So, so there are some really great engineers on the team who have done some really great work on um, kind of stabilizing our latency metrics uh, and then also helping us lower as well. Um, but you can see the, the results of turning off filter queries and also uh, no caching. Yeah. So what are some key takeaways? Uh, garbage collection performance is very important in solar, and we're experimenting with different ways uh, and different uh, types of garbage collection in order to, to um, effectively scale. Uh, the other thing is to avoid unnecessary work in solar. Uh, solar, uh, as many of you who have worked with solar know, is that you have to really you have to fully understand what you're working on or working with and how it impacts solar at scale before uh, productionalizing it. Otherwise, you'll reach um, very, very interesting behavior. Um, and then the other is that LTR features can be very expensive. Uh, back to Doug. Cool. So uh, I'll close things off. What happens when we, now that we can yeet, and I will say one of the big, big lessons for me in this project is how important partnership with infrastructure is between machine learning and infrastructure to make this uh, really work out well. Um, well, when we ran this earlier this year, we were reaching kind of a plateau of despair. And uh, especially since offline said these should win. Um, so that was puzzling. If you remember earlier, we said that offline metrics are really important. And if they don't correlate with online, that's a problem. And maybe they're a little bit better. There's like blue is actually the day one results. Maybe due to novelty or other things, it tends to fade away a little bit over the A-B test. Um, so we had to revisit our labels. And this is really an important takeaway. LTR is like blindly following the labels. When you do manual relevance work, you can use your own brain and judgment sometimes. Say, OK, this is just a guide. You really have to be uh, entirely focused on uh, NDCG and not, you can't use LGTM too much. The model is, is only as dumb as this, the training data. So one thing we learned is that the, in social search, the SERPs can change a lot. Like if you go to uh, search for this key bridge collapse is something that happened around the time I developed this talk. Like you can see uh, all these people and this is changing a lot. So when we actually develop labels, they don't actually reflect actual SERPs because SERPs are changing so much that you have to, uh, you're the, the chant like, the average like good visit, or, or I'm sorry, the average click plus dwell on one of these things is going to be uh, only gonna be available for like a couple hours maybe at most, or especially for a very key topic. So this is different than what I'm experiencing in e-commerce where maybe the SERP would change daily, uh, but here it really changes a lot. So, you know, we aggregate these, you know, it's pretty common we see these individual SERP interactions, we aggregate them to an average, but we, it's hard to do this when the SERP changes so much. So one thing we're looking at is actually just using the SERP directly to change, to train, taking out this middle aggregation step where we get a label, and instead just like treating, treating each of these as its own training example. Um, and the nice thing about that is it's sort of implicitly weighted. It's weighted by the number of times someone actually issued the search and had this one interaction. Um, and there's less modeling on training data. Uh, it's a bit like, it's a, can maybe, even things like position biases, maybe a, a model could even learn that. 
Um, and the other thing, the other big thing that we learned is we're not using this rich set of data. You may know about this concept of signals, which is like a, a query was, a post was interacted in the context of a query and had a high level of engagement. And we actually, in manual relevance, we actually use that to like boost up those results. We have a basically a, a collection that's just like what seems to get lots of interaction for a query, and we use that to boost. And we should be using these as features. We didn't want to because we were like, oh, this is too, this is like overfit. But really, and a model is supposed to be general and like not think about these things. But it's actually, uh, you know, we could debate that back and forth. But uh, how we use these is really important. And I'll, because we're at time, but the, and it also turns out these cover way more search traffic than we realized. We thought, oh, well, the right side, the, the generalized stuff really will apply to the tail. So we need to add these to our model as well. We need to treat these as LTR features. And we did this recently, actually. And luckily, uh, we, this uh, last time I gave this talk, we didn't have this graph updated. But as of now, we are even farther to the right as an A-B test we're running right now. But the last one we concluded that actually included signals as a feature. We haven't done the impression-based training data yet where I talked about using each SERP individually. But we did start using signals as a feature. And that uh, did start to have positive improvements on control. So that's uh, the conclusion. We are uh, starting to make progress finally and starting to see A-B test outcomes. But it's been a long road. And if, if uh, I want to go on the record and saying no one should expect an LTR project to take less than one to two years. So just be aware of that. This, this has been a long road of, of all of us working together on this. So thank you. Thank you, Doug and Charles. Uh, we have a question here. Well, that's discouraging. <laughs> so what are you going to build us which will take it from one to two years down to something more reasonable? What, when is User Behavior Insights coming out, or is it out? It's out. Okay, so I just need to I need to plug that. Um, you know what? The reason that that, that happens is uh, it's interesting to think back because I think like a lot of the reason that happens is uh, training data is really hard. It's often domain specific. There's often bugs. Uh, we found all kinds of interesting bugs, which could be a whole other topic. I don't have time to get into in like how data is collected. Um, uh, and every weird, like it's probably also at larger scale, you have like very specific, like things or legacy problems that are just around for analytics. All of these things are just contribute. And then like the infrastructure side, scaling that up. If we were a smaller scale shop, we might have. I could have just maybe yeeted it to production and not thought about it. But getting it to Reddit scale and spending like realizing we can do 10% now, so we can do A/B tests. Okay, maybe we can do 20% if we work on the GC. Uh, do we need to scale out more replicas? Like, uh, at a mature organization, I think it, this is one reason it takes a lot of time. Hello. What's that? Uh, a ton. Buy, I'm going to buy 20 copies. Oh, go ahead. Hello. Yeah, uh, thanks for the insights. My question is more on the ma machine learning side. Uh, so you mentioned that, um, so especially in case of Reddit, I think if a search matches the title of the post or the text of the post, it's a quite important feature. So I imagine that feature to be extremely important in the feature importance plot. I mean, the model might be driven by that feature. Mm -hmm. So in these kind of situations, how do you make sure that one feature is not dominating your results? And if I remove those features, the model is completely useless or it's not as impactful. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know how you uh, how you would do that because I think that feature is really if that feature is really important, it should be definitely in the model. Um, I do think it's interesting to study study what happens when you can. Is there other information that correlates with that, and what happens when you remove that from from the model? Um, yeah, I think if it's, I don't think I would be happy with search if it didn't match the title or the body. So, I don't think that's a problem necessarily. I think that's a, I think that's a feature, not a bug, so to speak. Thank you for a great talk. My question is like other uh, apps like WhatsApp and Twitter, like they, uh, you know, kind of spread fake news and stuff like that. So, how do you include like, uh, you know, in your relevance, like? that th those kind of things doesn't come up. 
Uh, what kind of things exactly? Uh, the fake news, wrong news with AI and. Things. Oh, like how do we? Oh, did you say phase? Like fake. Uh, oh, fake users. Yeah. Wrong news. I mean, so that you know it doesn't include in the signal of the models like. Uh, because if once tweeted many times, the fake news become <laughs> the right news for some people, right? Yeah. I don't think I quite understand the fake users. Fake, uh, fake news. Oh, fake news. Oh, okay. That's a great question. Uh, you know, um, one thing that's nice about Reddit, so we don't have this problem as much because it's so heavily moderated. Um, we do have statistics on the quality of contributors and like this kind of thing. But also, um, and certain subreddits are like better and more moderated than others. So um, we haven't yet, knock on wood, I'm sure it'll come up in our AI age where someone is circumventing things, but that hasn't yet been a problem, luckily. Hi, thanks for the great talk from both of you. I had a question about uh, Reddit has multiple user selected rankers, like hot, new, those kinds of things. For this project, how are you factoring that in? Are there any, can you reuse features across those things? Just, I'm very curious about that. Oh, great, yeah, we, we haven't changed the new or hot. We're, this is entirely focused on, on relevance. We could potentially, like we're sort of, I think one thing that's, that another lesson learned for LTR, starting with a narrow part of the search so that you're not like slamming infrastructure or not trying to solve too big of a machine learning problem and then gradually moving out is uh, so that you're shipping something of value um, while you're iterating is really important. But I could see like over time, it's gonna take time before we like do all of the things if we do them. Like you know, there's an argument that hot should be, hot or new should just be like more raw in a way and relevance is truly like something where LTR should be. There's a product decision. Thank you very much, Doug and Thank Charles. You. They will be around to ask, uh, to, to answer your questions if you have any. Thank you for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Great work. Yeah.